Hello, good evening, welcome. My name is Emily Hackshaw and I am the Director of Community Engagement at GPB. I am so glad that you're with us this evening for this important conversation about mental health. We are pleased to join the national movement to raise awareness about mental health this month in particular, as July is BIPOC Mental Health Month. Formerly, formally recognized in 2008, this designation was created to bring awareness to the unique struggles that underrepresented groups face in regard to mental illness in the US, honoring author and mental health advocate, B.B. Moore Campbell. GPB is pleased to partner with Compassionate Atlanta and filling in the gaps for this dialogue tonight. As we unpack some of these issues and the work being done here in Georgia to break down barriers and care for all of our neighbors. This event will be live captioned. You can follow along by clicking the closed caption live transcript button on the bottom of your screen. We've got an amazing panel of experts lined up and I'd like to invite you to share your questions using the Q&A function if you're watching with us in Zoom or share in the chat on Facebook. If you're streaming on Facebook, we will do our best to answer all of your questions. Last month, a new public media multi-platform initiative was launched focused on destigmatizing mental illness, exploring issues surrounding mental health in science and society. The initiative includes a four-hour documentary called Mysteries of Mental Illness that aired on GPB and is available to stream online at pbs.org. Decolonizing Mental Health is an accompanying 20 episode short form digital video series that explores inequities in access to mental health resources from communities that have been marginalized. We will be sharing some of those stories tonight to lay the foundation for this conversation. So let's take a quick look. I had just gotten to a point where I was um, functioning with the voices. One night you get five hours, but then the next night you get four, and then find yourself in a hypomanic to manic state. People distanced themselves from me because I didn't understand what was happening. We are seeing disparate experiences based on their race, gender identity, disability. In order to provide something to my people, I can't fail. That's not an option for me. All of the videos in this series are available to stream online. We're gonna share some links with you tonight. And I invite you to check them out following the conversation. We will be sharing a link in the chat for your reference. And now I would like to introduce Iabo Oni Pede, who will be moderating our conversation tonight. Iabo is a facilitator, keynote speaker, and a consultant, and she is the co-director of Compassionate Atlanta, and it is my pleasure to welcome her now. Thank you, Iabo. Take it away. Thank you, Emily. Good evening. We at Compassionate Atlanta have the awesome responsibility of advancing the culture of compassion. Of course that happens. To advance the culture of compassion in the greater Atlanta area. And we do this by responding to the asks of our community. We are honored and excited to respond to the community by moderating this amazing panel on decolonizing mental health. The word decolonizer, right? Decolonizing. Most folks think of the word colonizer as it was used as an insult in, um, in the movie Black Panther. I'm originally from Nigeria. We were, we were a country colonized by the British and we continue to have an enduring uh, lasting legacy of that colonization. So the word colonizer or decolonizing is actually very familiar to me. And in this American context, when we hear the word decolonizing, we think of the experiences of our Native American indigenous brothers and sisters and how they were colonized. However, in this context for mental health, 
What we're talking about is prioritizing Eurocentric white middle class values and that it may not apply to every demographic. Um, the word decolonize makes some folks feel uncomfortable as they might feel that they're being erased or asked to be secondary. And that is not the case. We, what we're talking about this evening in the context of mental health is about prioritizing the needs of the person who's in front of us that needs mental health support. Our panelists are gonna be instrumental in helping us understand what this word decolonizing means within the context of mental health and for all people, whether the person's homeless, Jewish, Nigerian like me, or rural, whatever it is, right? There's an application that we need to hear about. For instance, I think of a white parent with a black child through adoption or a mixed marriage. Does that white parent understand that her black child or his black child might have a non-Eurocentric need in therapy, right? Or what about that kid's Vietnamese friend that the mother is seeing uh, something may be going on with that kid. How do I ask questions? What would culturally relevant mental health support look like for that kid? Today, we have an incredible panel, and I want to state the obvious as we look at our panel. Our panel is going to focus on African-American mental health concerns. However, this amazing series that I've watched three times on decolonizing mental health explores the unique mental health challenges faced by, by a variety of unrepresented, underrepresented communities and the innovative approaches being taken to ensure that everyone has access to culturally competent quality mental care. I was really fascinated with the talk on prayer as part of mental health um, pres prescription, really. We invite you in the series to hear the lived experiences of Muslims, Native Americans, Guatemalans, Latinx, Asians, developmentally disabled folks, folks who have experienced homelessness, as well as our LGBTQ IA siblings. So now I'm going to introduce you to our panel, if our panel could come up. Um, Oni Po is one of my favorite people on the planet. She is a mental health and disabilities advocate and educator who lives in Augusta, Georgia. She is the founder of an organization called Filling in the Gaps, and yes, she does that. Their mission is to offer education, advocacy, and support for individuals and families affected by mental health and disabilities. Oni's secret weapon is joy. I love working with Oni. She, this is the second event she has championed with uh, Georgia Public GPB and with Compassionate Atlanta. So welcome, Oni. Next, Thank I'd you. like to introduce you to Sandra Phillips. Ms. Sandra is a licensed professional counselor and owns a private practice group, Transformational Behavioral Health. She is um, the founder of Transformational Transformation Training Institute, which is committed to providing low cost and free trainings on multicultural diversity and behavioral health issues. She is also an expertise in military populations, substance abuse, as well as faith based populations. She is based also in Augusta, Georgia. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Sandra. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Julius Jessup Peterson, who is the owner and founder, check this out, check out the name of his company, Roots, Seeds and Branches. Don't you love that? It's an integrative mental health experience, look at the name, right? That offers psychotherapy in synergy with social justice and science fiction. I can't wait to ask him about that. They advocate for decolonization of psychotherapy to create better conditions for present and future generations. And last but certainly not least, one of the most, one of the people I most admire ever, 
Ms. Fonta High, who is a licensed professional counselor and addiction counselor specializing in trauma treatment in Decatur, Georgia. She's a community organizer and an activist and serves as co-chair for the Beacon Hill Black Alliance for Human Rights and is co-chair for the Decolonized Decatur Committee. Y'all are incredible. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So they're precious therapists. Um, one of the video clips in Decolonizing Mental Health is Dr. Vivian Jackson in the series saying, the six A's are a framework of barriers to care. And she addresses disparities of care as availability. Does the service exist in my area? Accessibility, transport, being able to take off from work. What happens if you're late? Awareness, are they aware that it exists in their community? Affordability, can you afford the copay or the services? appropriate, the care that is offered may not be high quality or culturally relevant. Is it appropriate to the demographic in front of them? And the last is acceptability. Is there an issue that needs to be addressed? Is such diagnosis culturally accepted as a mentally health, as a mental health issue? The example she gave is the teacher saying the young man has a mental health issue. The parents saying nothing, ain't nothing wrong with that boy. Right. So those were the six A's. Right. What does it mean to you as African American therapists to decolonize mental health in terms of these six A's? Who would like to go first? Go ahead, Julius. I think it's important that for us as African American providers or just providers of color or, or bodies of culture to really meet people where they are to really meet them within the conditions of their lives and not engage with them in a way that imposes values or bias. Uh, many of the consumers, individuals in my care that I work with describe uh, a history of trauma when they feel that a bias or a set of values are imposed upon them when they seek services, particularly when there's a level of white body supremacy experience within the therapeutic relationship. I often hear that many of the structures that people are seeking assistance from that they've been told are designed to help them often create a level of harm uh, with implications of deciding uh, if they're worthy of services, what the system perceives them as a person and to, in regards to their value. And so I think it's important for us again to meet people where they are, acknowledge their humanity and relate to them in a non-hierarchical way. Beautiful, non-hierarchical. That's what I got from you, Julius, thank you. Miss Sandra, would you like to go next? What does it mean to you as an African-American therapist to decolonize mental health? Uh, to me, it means uh, doing the work. If you're going to be a clinician and you're going to see persons of diversity of different races, then we as clinicians, we might not know everything about a certain culture of a different race or whatever, but we need to do our due diligence to learn some of it and then allow the clients to introduce themselves to us, let them be the expert of themselves to share what pertinent information we need to be able to help them in the best possible way. Because even though they're a culture and we can go on Google or whatever and Wikipedia and find some information, not everyone is something, you know, it's not like everybody will fit those criteria. So we wanna make sure that we lend uh, room for their uniqueness as well. Thank you. So treating people, meeting people where they are and treating them as a whole individual. Beautiful. Fanta, would you like to tell us what you consider, um, what does it mean to you to decolonize yeah. mental health? Absolutely. And Julius and Sandra already spoke to it. And what was coming up for me is what around moving that hierarchical structure, making sure that's not in place. In addition to Sandra talking about recognizing that that individual is the expert in their life and 
traditionally years ago when people went through training and went through grad school, it was through for so many of us, so many people that Eurocentric way of believing that you as the therapist are the expert, but it's not that at all. And it comes from that colonization process. So if we're treating that person, recognizing that they are the expert in their life, then we approach it as though we are walking with them on their journey and we are partnering with them. And it also means coming from a strengths-based place. The system is set up in a way where there's reward for that person remaining sick. And we have to recognize that's part of the colonization process as well. But if we're gonna approach it differently and decolonize, we're approaching treatment and walking inside that person with the understanding that they're coming to the table with many strengths. And we wanna enhance those strengths as a part of helping them move towards wellness and recovery and understanding there's a difference between treatment and recovery and we wanna support their recovery because that exists and will happen outside of our office when they're not sitting in front of us anymore. Fantastic, thank you. Hierarchy and treating people as individuals and from what you said, you are not the expert. The individual is the expert of themselves. Okay, wonderful. What I want us to do next is take a look at a clip. I want us to meet the very handsome, wonderful, lovely Lloyd Johnson, who beautifully describes his experience with schizophrenia. I invite you all to listen for the hierarchy, to listen for how a person can be their own expert and to listen for all the things um, Ms. Sandra talked about, about a person taking, um, a person, the therapist taking care of who's in front of them, the whole person, by looking at this clip on Lloyd. Also think of the six A's, which I've put in the chat. Thank you. I am Lloyd Johnson Hill II. Uh, I am uh, the second because I was named after my grandfather. Uh, I'm a certified peer support specialist here in the state of South Carolina. Uh, I was born in Oklahoma, lived all up and down the East Coast, and now I live here in Columbia, South Carolina, where I provide as much help as I can to other people living in recovery. My great-grandmother spent quite a bit of time raising us and helping my mom raise us. My father did a lot of time, so it was just the women in the family that took good care of us growing up, so. Um, but it was good, you know, we always had what we needed and we got what we wanted sometimes. So we just, we, we cherished those moments when we got what we wanted. When I recall, my symptoms uh, starting out, I was about 13 years old. I was, uh, I was in the Department of Juvenile Justice and uh, I had to do some community service. After that 30 days, I had to do community service. A part of that community service was picking up trash in the projects where I lived. I found my first bag of weed while I was picking up the trash with that stick with the nail on it. So uh, we called a friend of mine, you know, we rolled it up and we smoked. I was walking down the street after I'd smoked, I was walking down the street and I saw a guy who hadn't seen me in a while because I was actually in the Department of Juvenile Justice. So uh, he's like, yo man, where you been? I ain't seen you in a while, where you been? I said, I'm doing community service. He said, well, how many hours do you have? And I said, 80. And he and, and in my mind, the word 80 just kept echoing over and over. It was 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, just 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. That's kind of how my symptoms begin. And it just transitioned into me believing that I could have conversations with people in my brain. People, as they talk about schizophrenia, they talk about hearing voices or responding with voices. For me, it was those voices were people that I knew. People that um, if I heard your voice and I, I saw your face, I could actually have a conversation with you, what I thought to be in my mind, or over time it changed into thinking that it was a third world. Over time that looked like um, I was more quiet. I wouldn't talk out loud as much. It took quite a while for other people to understand that I had mental problems. It took quite a while. Even though I was struggling with my stuff, I fit in with everyone that was doing the things that we were doing. And I smoked a lot. So oftentimes when anything was strange happening with me, someone could easily just say, you know, Lloyd, you smoke too much. You need to go sleep that off. Or um, you had too much to drink. You need to go sleep that off. 
as I'm going through these symptoms of symptoms that I don't even realize are happening, no one around me knows what's happening. And I believe, I believe that's because of several reasons. One being that the folks in my area were all um, struggling with one thing or another. We lived in the projects, so people had financial issues. They had issues with people and friends going to prison. So everyone had something going on. So I, I can't imagine that people uh, uh, in the immediate neighborhood, even in my family, uh, could even pause long enough to, to recognize anything strange going on with me because there were strange things going on with them, you know? Secondly, is I'm not sure that as a young black man, I'm not sure I was high on the priority scale. You know, that when I look back at the many different facets of being 15, 14, 16, when I, when I look at school, I wasn't connected in band or sports or after uh, extracurricular activities. People who were the decision makers and the, the, the real shakers and movers in our community, I, I can't say that I was relevant um, to notice. I had just gotten to a point where I was um, functioning with the voices. It was a part of my life at this point. Around the same time, I'm having this conversation with my mom. She says, Lloyd, my boyfriend has a problem. Can you help him? And I'm like, you know, what's the problem? She said, well, he wants to die, but he doesn't want to kill himself. Can you help? And for me, it was instantaneous. Sure, I can do it, no problem. I was walking down the street after I'd smoked, I was walking down the street and I saw a guy who hadn't seen me in a while because I was actually in the Department of Juvenile Justice. So uh, he's like, yo man, where you been? I ain't seen you in a while, where you been? I said, I'm doing community service. He said, well, how many hours do you have? And I said, 80. And he and, and in my mind, the word 80 just kept echoing over and over. It was 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. Just 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. That's kind of how my symptoms begin. And it just transitioned into me believing that I could have conversations with people in my brain. At the age of about, at the age of 16, I had just turned 16. I had just gotten to a point where I was um, functioning with the voices. It was a part of my life at this point. Around the same time, I'm having this conversation with my mom in this third world, what I thought to be third world. And she says, Lloyd, my boyfriend has a problem. Can you help him? And I'm like, you know, what's the problem? She said, well, he wants to die, but he doesn't want to kill himself. Can you help? And for me, it was instantaneous. Sure, I can do it, no problem. I go upstairs and my mother says she could hear me coming up the stairs because I was talking. At this time, even though I had the holster on my hip, I did have the firearm in my back pocket. I walk into her room, I go over to talk to her. She was sitting on her bed at the head of the bed and her boyfriend was at the foot of the bed brushing his hair. And I pointed the firearm and I shot twice in his direction. He was shot once in the head, once in the neck. And as a result of the shots, he did pass away. My mother's, you know, she's upset. So she walks up to me and she's hit me you know, and screaming at the same time. And she got on the phone and I just remember at that point um, her saying, my son did it. And it was like, at that point, my heart just sunk. It's one of the harder things to live with these days. I have a eight year old daughter uh, and she is the absolute She's the absolute best thing that's ever happened to me. I share my story as much as I do because if, if I can help someone keep their daughter, their father, their son, if I can help that, then I feel like I owe that to my community at this point. I owe that. Shortly after, same night, I was incarcerated. I spent the next three months in lockup. Lockup is seclusion, 23 hours a day lockup, one hour out a day in shackles and handcuffs to clean your room, make a phone call, and take a shower. Here I am in lockup, and the voices for me are louder than they've ever been. 
Now, there was this one correctional officer. She would come by and she would talk to me. And she would, wouldn't, she wouldn't talk to me. She would listen to all of this stuff I had to say. I know it was exhausting because she would just kind of, she would just lean up against the door like this while I was talking. So I knew she was exhausted, but she would listen. Listen without any type of judgment or any type of despising who I am as a person. Um, she listened and she said, you know, that's helpful what you're going through. And, and her exact words were, you don't have to do this alone, is what she said. I, I can say that that was a, a huge pivotal moment for me, just having someone to care about me. So back in 2004, I became a certified peer support specialist, uh, and I worked for the uh, South Carolina Department of Mental Health for 14 and a half years in doing so as well. And in doing peer support, peer support is uh, meeting with people one-on-one, -on -one, meeting with people um, in group settings, meeting with people in their families, uh, meeting with people in their psychiatrists or psychologists. Um, and, and we stand as a bridge almost uh, because as I have these conversations with other people who are living in recovery, I realize that many of our experiences, both with mental illness and um, outside of mental illness, have been similar. Whether it be financial strain or relationships or schooling, it's similar. So we can connect in a, in a very different way. Going into peer support, I think I was struggling with who I was. I didn't, I didn't have enough space in between the experiences that I had as a teenager and the experiences I had as a free adult to really identify myself as anything else. I saw myself as that young guy from Georgetown, South Carolina. So being a peer support specialist really helped me identify that it's okay to live in recovery. It's okay to take care of myself the way I need to and, and to be that as I am moving around so I can live in recovery and just that alone, I'm not even talking about opening my mouth, just living in recovery alone was inspiring other people who were living in recovery. Wow, how amazing is that? In his own words, Lloyd said, it took quite a while for people to notice something was not quite right with him. Um, everyone was struggling, incarceration and poverty. As a young black man, he just was not a priority and he ends up committing a crime, he ends up being incarcerated. And I'm so grateful he has reclaimed his life. So um, which one of my therapists would love to answer this question? One of the six A's is about awareness. Are you even aware that there's a, that not even that there's a mental health issue, like that's part of the problem here, which I want you to address, but that there's services that can help, right? There's so much cultural shame and stigma and secrecy around mental health issues. What do we do to dismantle this idea that we must not appear broken or fragile? And how do we address this? What comes up for you? Fanta, would you like to start out on that one? Sure. sure. I really okay. believe to challenge the stigma, we have to start talking about it out loud, right? And creating some normalcy about it, our struggles. Part of what's, what, there's many things that helped us to get to where we are as a people, Black people, to where we are today. And we're certainly resilient, strong in so many ways, but an inability to acknowledge that we are feeling weakness or that we are weak or that we're fallible human beings that also can get sick 
is what's been a downfall and it's been part of the culture. So that normalcy I'm talking about has to be like, we're talking about our mental health challenges. Like we are talking about our high blood pressure and why we don't need to eat that fried chicken tonight or whatever it may be. It's got to be that normal. And I think when we create that kind of normalcy, then we can actually make some changes that we haven't yet made as a people where people don't have to feel that stigma and they can get help without the shame attached. Yes, thank you. Ms. Sandra, what are the unique challenges facing our public, uh, rural populations? Access, you know, being able to get to the locations, you know, they're probably gonna only have like one community service board. And for some reason, they're like out in an area that is far from where persons uh, live, where the residential areas. So if you don't have public transportation, or if you get there late for an appointment, then they'll cancel you out. They won't see you once you do find a ride to pick you up to take you to your appointment. So persons fall through the gap uh, just by not having the accessibility to get to an appointment and to know what else is in the community that may can help them. Okay. And then also for you, Ms. Sander, what would you say to clergy about facing, about how to address mental health issues in communities of faith, especially in the Black church or in Black religious circles? Right. In the African-American population and culture, I mean, uh, religious faith is a big part of it. So the church is like the, the influencer of the communities. So we really have to get our pastors uh, church leaders to be stakeholders of it, to, to let them know that we're not trying to replace therapy, you know, for prayer. You know, we want prayer and therapy together. So we first have to start with education to let them know what it is uh, about mental health. It's not saying that you don't believe in God or you don't think that God can, you know, heal your body, heal your mind. But sometimes you need to talk about all these different things. So I think just educational conversations with pastors, church leaders, because a lot of people in the community listen to our pastors. They might do a lot of things, but if pastor, uh, Ronald, pastor, A, whatever, you know, says that this is something that is good for you, then they're going to listen to that. So I think we need to start at the head uh, by educating our pastors and uh, leaders in the church to get them on board and then spread out into the community. Thank you for that. Um, Julius, I would love to hear you tell us what the priority is for you in terms of practicing psychotherapy and synergy with social justice and science fiction. How does that help us with decolonizing mental health? I think that many people need to believe that a future that they cannot experience yet is possible. Mm. I think in reference to your prior questions, for us to really uh, address stigma, we have to address distrust. There has to be some atonement and repair in systems that have perpetuated harm for people to be open to experience services, to experience connection, to experience authenticity. Um, and I think that for many black bodies and bodies of culture, there has been a history of gaslighting when it comes to addressing their physical and mental health needs. I hear messages all the time from clients that their bodies have been deemed as subpar, less than human, um, and ultimately defective. And so for me, the synergy of science fiction, social justice is communicating a message that you are not defective. You are not deficient. You are not broken. You are not less than. You are not other than. Um, you are more than what other people can imagine you to be. And the cage that's been built within the limitations of other people's imaginations is something that you can break free from. OK, OK. Thank you for that. Um, Julius, I also wanna ask you this question. What, could you address the need for mental health along with chronic illness 
especially in the black community. We're talking about folks with breast cancer. We're talking about folks with HIV AIDS. Talk to me, there's stigma on mental health, there's stigma in chronic illness. Talk to me about that relationship and what we all can do. For me as a provider, it goes back again to trust. Um, when there's resistance, when there's stigma, there's a history of distrust. Um, the other piece of that, you know, in the words of Resma Monaco, uh, when it's hysterical, it's historical. There's so much trauma that's been interpreted as culture. And we have to name that and acknowledge that first before healing can occur mm -hmm. and really create an environment where people feel safe enough to trust their bodies, to listen to what that voice says, to listen to what they feel within themselves. Um, because we've been conditioned to not do so. It's part of white body supremacy. Okay, thank you. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, Fanta, how, can you address what it means to heal in pu public, talking about group therapy, right? Um, because I think sometimes communities use group, group methodology and find more success with it with non-Eurocentric non -Euro white middle-class folk. Sometimes a group healing process, a circle process, a prayer process could be more healing for someone who identifies as a body of culture. Could you discuss what that means to heal in community and in the presence of others? Yeah, as, as I answer that question, I'm thinking about what Julius just said and what comes up is safety. And when there's safety, you can really facilitate healing, right? That, that healing can take place for that person. And so for a lot of people, there is increased feeling of safety when they're connected with people who they have similar like cultural experiences with because there's like a starting place where some things you don't really have to explain can be rightfully assumed and that can help create some safety when you're using that same language. You may not have to feel the need to code switch and all that, which so many of us do. And when you can see yourself and someone else, right, in that reflection, that's a part of helping to facilitate healing as well. But I think again, it being those right individuals around you needs to be considered by providers and providers understanding how those cultural differences can at times disrupt that healing process, which is why we see in even affinity groups in workplaces, right? Because there's increased feeling of safety in those particular groups. You may have much respect, admiration for your coworker of a different cultural group, but when you can come together with people that look like you, again, there's some things that can be assumed and you can work from from that and work out differences a lot of times a lot easier, especially if there's some shared or common language or experiences. So what I hear you is saying is that where there are different identities, the focus on the difference becomes secondary when you move into an affinity group and you can start actually at a more advanced level. Absolutely. And you can reduce the emotional labor that's already going to be involved. Healing is emotional labor, but there's a lot of times that emotional labor that's placed upon us as people of color, as Black people, when we have to do the work of necessarily consciously doing so, but showing up a certain way in front of white people as a part of that conditioning, right? For the sake of safety, preservation on the job so we don't potentially lose our job or et cetera. There's so many consequences and losses that we are facing that we just get conditioned to behave a certain way. And when we can get with our people, those defenses can be lessened. Perfect. Now, um, what would you, have you ever, provided care for folks covered by Medicare or Medicaid? What is your experience with that? What do you know about that? Does that create accessibility problems under the six A's? What's that question for me? Yes, yes. or anyone. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to dominate. So I'll just say very briefly, yes, I have when I worked for years for the Community Service Board, which Sandra mentioned, and the Community Service Board is establishing communities to help those who are 
uninsured, underinsured, or don't have any insurance. So in that community setting, those who have Medicaid can receive services and that can help tremendously with accessibility. But there's other things that can be problematic that I've seen from a lot of people who've had experiences in systems like community service boards that have not experienced to a large degree, I would say decolonization as so many systems have not. Um, and those systems benefit, again, as I said earlier, when people stay sick. So I'm a huge advocate of people who are seeking treatment, connecting with recovery organizations or systems, places like the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse, right? Or RCOs, Recovery Community Organizations, or the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. There's many different pathways to recovery. It doesn't have to be in the traditional mental health system where even they come to see a provider like me who's licensed. There's many different pathways. So it can be complicated, it can be complicated. Thank you for that. And I know you don't want me to focus on you, but I do have a follow-up question. And when I move to someone else, do you mind please going in the chat and making sure you share those resources with all the panelists and attendees that you just mentioned? So my follow-up question is about this issue of feeling safe with people who may look like you. Right. So me as a black woman, I may not want to go see a white male gay therapist because I am a black female straight woman. Right. So how do you figure out how do you what, where is the pipeline of people that look like you? How does someone go about finding a therapist that they feel can mirror some of their experiences? Is it difficult for people of color to find therapists who are not white? And is there a movement to cultivate non-white therapists? And all of us are going to answer those questions. So you go ahead first. So I also want to say this, because I don't mean to make a very rigid statement, because certainly there's many of us who have experienced trauma perpetrated by those that look like us too, right? So it's just not a given just because you get with someone that looks like you automatically will feel safe. So I want to put that disclaimer out there. And part of the problem that exists in the mental health system is that information that you're talking about, that you want me to share in the chat, that all my colleagues will share, it's easily accessible. It's like a treasure hunt to find this information, right? And it shouldn't be like that. And that's the system, the way it's set up and why it needs to be decolonized in a way that it needs to be decolonized. So coming back to me earlier, talking about that normalcy, part of creating the normalcy is us openly in public discussing these issues, but this information being made broadly available to people. It should be on billboards. It should be Sides of buses, it should be on milk cartons, it should be everywhere. Because if we don't have mental health, as we've heard it said before, we really don't have anything. And so the focus has to be again on mental health and not on the mental illness, what's right with you, not what's wrong with you. Again, a total change in thinking. So in that way, it starts with decolonizing our mindsets before we even decolonize the system. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Julius and Ms. Sandra, do you have any um, responses for us? I just want to echo the importance of naming things out loud that Fonta expressed and to shift our language and our presentation towards wholeness and healing instead of coping and rewarding sickness and dysfunction. I think it helps on a macro level and a micro level, and I think it what, it can happen in conversations, it can happen in public spaces, but that shift has to start with us. We have to take care of ourselves and each other. Okay, thank you. Ms. Sandra. Um, yes, I just, um, with uh, fun to what she said about, you know, the disclaimer she put out there about, you know, a black person might necessarily not, may not want a black therapist. It's based on whatever the situation is. If their hurt has came from that place, then they may choose to have someone differently. Mm -hmm. And then if we are black clinicians and we are seeing someone of another uh, race or culture, then we also have to put the, the, you know, the time in. So it's not just that non-white, uh, I mean, non-black therapists need to put the work in, but all therapists that see persons of diversity, of culture, of race. We all have to do that. When somebody sits in front of us 
and they're different, whether it's a black man, it's still a man. You know, uh, you know, so I have to do that work or somebody comes in in a wheelchair then they could be a black man with a disability. So we it just continuously grow to that individual. So we need to look at all those different rams when we're uh, treating persons. Excellent. Excellent. Julius, could you talk to us about this concept of the person was directing the question to Ms. Fonta, but I think you would, I would like you to answer it, Julius, that she made a comment about the extra work that a Black client needs to do when working with a white therapist. What ways can we as white therapists do, what can we do to increase the trust, comfort, safety of the client if the client is of a different race or ethnicity than, than the therapist? I think the first part is that for many of my white colleagues, I get the feedback that they feel that cultural competence is enough. And I want to echo that is not. There's also a need for cultural humility. For many of the individuals that I work with, I get a lot of feedback that when they go to a therapist that doesn't look like them, part of what creates or exacerbates their symptoms is this experience where they feel that they are paying someone to teach them. And so it's important that uh, providers who are not of color, when they're working with someone who looks like them, who has a different story, a different cultural narrative, that they are open to a level of correction. And when that correction happens, they don't become rigid or defensive or weaponize their tears in response to it. Because when that happens, the message that the client receives is, I'm not safe with you. And that your discomfort is more important than me being seen, heard, and understood in this experience. Ah. No one wants to be anywhere where they have to pay to teach someone else because they're not willing to move beyond their fragility. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's important. Okay. Someone asks, and I'm not sure that this person says, how can you how can sticking to a person of your own color truly help who would like to answer that one please go right ahead Julie. i'm very comfortable with that question okay i i want to echo something that fanta said earlier about the power of affinity groups when you go into a space and there are things that are unspoken and unsaid that you don't have to explain because they're understood, because they're felt, because there's a deep connection. And that creates a level of safety. And for, for many people, they've experienced that violence that Fonta was discussing earlier in the workplace, in public, where it doesn't feel safe to not conceal parts of them. And so when they come into a therapeutic experience where they can take off that mask, I think many of us know what I'm talking about when I say that, and their shields and all of their defenses and have someone hold their wounds and all their soft places, that's powerful, that's safe. And that's just something that some people can't experience for people who don't look like them and they should not have to explain or defend that. And so to me, that question is almost like saying to a person who has like say there's been domestic violence between a male and a female and then and the female is the victim and you're telling the female to go to a male therapist right if i perceive violence against me from men i cannot heal in the presence of men i need to be aff affirmed in my gender right come to see us are not responsible for our biases or our limitations and they are worthy of a care where they don't have to defend or protect their needs. Absolutely. I love that, that they, they, what you're saying that they don't have, they just need healing period. <laughs> okay. Here's a pastor currently enrolled in a mental health coaching course through the American Association of Christian Counseling. Mental health issues are prevalent in the community that this person's servicing. Are there in models, are there models currently being utilized that a church can utilize to be service oriented to serve the mental health community? Ms. Sandra, you might want to ask answer that and you all, whoever, 
anyone. Absolutely. You know, um, there's a program, uh, Mental Health 101, First Aid Mental Health, or great programs for the church. There's a group called The Pew that has information out there on how to uh, bring mental health awareness into the church in different segments. So absolutely, it's out there. A lot of churches are starting to partner with a community therapists to have them to come in and do like symposiums. I know I've done a couple like a grief during the holidays or bring them in to do like a, a workshop or something in the church. So okay. uh, absolutely. Just reach out to some of the community providers. And just, what, what would you recommend in terms of this? I also think of a lot of churches as places where there are AA groups and NA groups. Is that part of the church supporting mental health services? A lot of the AA groups or the NA groups that are housed in some of the churches are not directly connected to the churches. The churches just right. allow the space right. you know, for them to have that. But you do have some that have Celebrate Recovery that you know are a part of the ministry in the church. But I would say the different uh, groups that are within the church are great outlets for persons that need that connectiveness uh, uh, to become more comfortable to seek out therapy. Or okay. Um, we have a very interesting question coming up and this question is more about the structure of your professional endeavors. Talk about addressing the in-group hierarchy bias and discrimination right this is the what we're trying to decolonize that can derail exploring culturally congruent and incongruent recovery pathways i think this is an academic for example why is the percentage of non-whites on medication assisted treatment tiny more to the point why do so few people care about the tiny percentage wants to talk about that well uh you know i don't have a lot but what i would say is that uh the perception and it all goes back to labeling you know what is important to society and when you look at what is uh the dominant society uh that we're surrounded then that's how we're driven to show what is important and what is not important you know, uh, when we had the big uh, crack, you know, epidemic, you know, a lot of advocates Americans that still now go to prison, but then it was the opioid, I could, you know, came about and then there's treatment for uh, persons of another race. So clearly it is just this divide. You know, I have persons that share with me if a person of color go to the emergency room in pain, uh, they're often thought to be uh, seeking, drug seeking. Someone of another color enter in and they may be really drug seeking, but they get they leave there with the drugs. And, and this person might have a flare up, you know, because of something that's going on with them medically. So all of this is based into that, that melting pot that everybody wants us to be. But we're not a melting pot. We cannot liquefy into one culture and treat everybody like that. We just can't do it. So uh, the only way that we're going to be able to rectify is to be able to look at everybody for who they are and where they come from and to meet their needs and not to try to justify. No, whatever your needs are, let us treat that. But I think it's uh, of the, our thinking. You know, we got to, to do some transformation in the way that we're thinking if we want to do something new. It's almost like, what is insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. So we got to think differently. We got to treat people from their perspective, not what we think we know that they need. We need to listen to them and then treat their needs. Right, right, thank you. Um, how do you feel as therapists seeing Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka prioritize their mental health on a global platform, right? 
I felt so, Julius, I know you want to jump in there too. I was so proud. And it really comes back to what I've been saying through this conversation. There has to be normalcy around it. And the only way that's going to happen is if we start saying these things out loud, sharing our stories, that we can, again, break down the stigma and the shame. I'm so proud. So proud. And then even Shakari, right? Agreed. A lot of folks did not think about the fact that these six A's plus the stigma may have prevented her from going to get therapeutic help or medication to just sleep at night because her mama died and some, some uh, journalists just sprung that on her, right? We are, we are also entitled to mental health considerations. We're entitled to that. I think it's important that we as black and brown bodies remember that our bodies and our wholeness are more important than these systems. They are more important than these structures. And I think these recent events remind us that if we put our bodies and our wholeness first, others will adjust. And it's not for us to overcompensate or overfunction to keep these systems and these structures alive. Too much has been built on our backs. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Wise, wise words. Yeah. A quick thing that, you know, a lot of people look and say, you know, well, why didn't she just stick it out there? But being, you know, having self-care is not being selfish. You know, th that's not being selfish. And a lot of times they just want these athletes to just do it as an entertainment. But that's their job. So a lot of us in our job get stressed out. So why don't we feel like they should be? And I know I do my job maybe in front of one person at a time, my clients. But you're talking about the whole world watching you do your job. So why do we think that they wouldn't have some of these normal things as increased anxiety? So, right. so they're human. So I'm so proud of her. And I just hate that she's thinking all that she's going through, she's still wondering, will they still love me? And so to Simone, I say, yes, we love you dearly. That have not changed and we support you. I want to share a quote, if I may. And this is from Audre Lord, a queer feminist poet and many things, educator. And she said, caring for myself, self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. And I don't know what the political beliefs are of the people listening, but many of us believe that we are at war. And as Julius was speaking, our bodies have been warred upon. And as a part of decolonizing our mindset, we have to make some drastically different choices. Yes, and embrace Sandra's self-care is an act of resistance and it is necessary for us as a people. Absolutely. Thank you, Fonte. You're such an advocate for protecting Black people and I'm grateful for that. Let me run through a few more questions that we have. We have mental health crisis in our communities of persons using unprescribed or illegal substances to cope with other, with other underlying mental health charges, as we saw with Lloyd. He's smoking pot and then he's hearing voices. He's probably smoking that pot to keep the voices calm. He says, what Im this person says, what impact does, somebody move my question. Okay, what impact does substance abuse have in person seeking and maintaining mental health recovery? Second question, which is related to that, what can one do to bring about more public awareness of current, our current mental health crises, challenges, and advocacy to local and federal allocator for mental health fundings? Not sure I'm totally understand. Did y'all understand that? I didn't really I, get that. I'm hearing that there are the questions about access mm -hmm. and distribution of resources and finding a more holistic response to a crisis. Yeah, um, and, also and this, this question of what impact does substance abuse have on persons seeking and maintaining mental health recovery? Yeah, and I can speak to that. 
yeah. addiction counselor. And it can be varied. It could be that an individual first had some underlying mental health challenges and then began to use as a way of coping. And then that became secondary or not. And regardless, as that person presents with issues connected to the substance use or the mental health challenges, both need to be treated. So it often comes up in conversation, you know, chicken or the egg, it, it really doesn't matter. Both need to be treated if that substance use is getting in the way of that person experiencing wellness in life, if it's disrupting relationships, right? And now we look at substance use on a spectrum. It's not about abuse or dependence. What is that use? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? But to, to what degree is it interfering with that person's life? And are they motivated towards abstinence? Do we need to take on a self-harm um, reduction approach? Right? There's multiple ways to approach it. It really depends on that person, their goals, their desires for themselves and how they wanna live their lives. Wonderful. So the second question about what can one do to bring about more public awareness of our current mental health crisis challenges and advocacy to local and federal allocation for mental health funding. The first um, mental health event we did with GPB and uh, filling in the gaps, Georgia is dead last in federal allocation. We don't get money because we don't ask for it. We don't advocate for it. It is not a fiscal priority with the state of Georgia. So that's the answer to that. We need NAMI to help us be better advocates. So if someone could please put NAMI in the chat, that's where we do our political advocacy. I did, Iyabo. I put that in the chat a few minutes ago. Y'all are on this. See how dedicated these people are to our mental health for all of us. I love these therapists. So let's close out with this question. Do you have thoughts, suggestions about how to address the strong black woman, the strong black man narrative, trope, stereotype that exists in some families? I work with teens who have parents and grandparents who do not accept how the teens present their concerns of their personal mental health. For me, there needs to be a shift from coping to healing. Mm. We often hear when a person brings a grievance or a rupture or an injury, oh, you all right, you're gonna be okay. Shake that off, keep it moving, right? And so with that lack of acknowledgement, that doesn't bring about healing. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a, on a gaping wound. Mm. And for many of our elders, and you know, to be frank, our ancestors, there are so many injuries that are not acknowledged. One of the things I tell the people in my care is that if it's hysterical, it's historical. And some of the pain that we're carrying in our bodies doesn't belong to us. And some of the trauma in our family has become cultural, it's become a norm. And so it's important for us to, as providers to name that trauma that's become cultural, that's become intergenerational, that's become normal and to give space so that wounds can be seen and acknowledged before we can engage in real healing so that we can just stop coping. Oh, that is brilliant. So as black women, we know there's that trope of the strong black woman. Miss Sandra, Miss Fanta, from your heart, personal and therapeutic experience. I don't wanna be anybody's strong black woman, but please. Right. Tell us. I am not your superwoman. And did someone also say that? <laughs> did, did someone sing that? <laughs> yes, yes. But I want to I'm gonna take it further back before we get to womanhood. And it starts with changing the messages that again, talking about Julius, the ancestors and the elders that we speak to the children. And oftentimes when this comes up in conversation, I think about that little child that gets hurt, that falls down, that scrapes their knee. And then the adult tells them, you're fine, you're all right, get up, boy, don't cry. Those sorts of messages are told to our little girls and told to our little boys. And we internalize those things. And then we hold on to the lie that we're all right, even when we're hurt. And we may not be all right for that moment, 
And being willing to acknowledge that is critical for us to get to that healing that Julius is talking about. So changing that messaging when we're young is important. Speaking to my elders, please hear me when I say that, and I say that with all due respect, we gotta start talking to the children in a different manner, right? And then us as adults being willing to do the work to say and acknowledge we're not all right for that moment doesn't mean that we won't be later on, but the way to the healing is to acknowledge where we're at in the moment. Beautiful. Miss Sandra, would you like to talk about that? Yes, I would just say, um, stop the secrets. You know, stop the secrets, start talking. You know, if we have those conversations, then we can break some of that generational uh, illness or emotional that's going on for year after year after year, that we can find out that we look at auntie that we've seen that we can handle everything. But if auntie would tell the truth, no, she couldn't. There was nights that she cried, days she didn't want to be with anybody or whatever. So we need to know that about our family so we can know how to prevent these things before they even come our way. But we got to start having conversations with everybody and then allowing our persons to talk outside of the house. That's a big thing in our culture. What's done in the household stays in the household. No, we got to allow them to take some of those things to the therapy room and to be able to share them to get that complete uh, healing, to unmask all of it and to be able to share. And then we as clinicians, we have to be able to hold that space, unjudgmental space, and, and take care of them. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I don't know if anybody noticed that there's someone on our panel. I have not spoken, I've not called her name at all. Miss Oni Poe, would you please make yourself available to me? <laughs> hey, pretty. Yes, Iyabo, I am here. Yes. So as we wow. wrap this up, as we wrap this up, what does this panel and this evening mean to you? Tell us about filling in the gaps and what this means to you. Uh, great question, Yabo. This actually means everything to me. As I think about the um, six A's that we referenced with um, the, one of the panelists or one of the um, people on the, the film, one of the A's that I think is missing, or what I might add is acknowledgement. Um, tonight is about simply acknowledging that mental health should be discussed. Acknowledging that mental wellness is, is trumps mental illness. And the more we have these type conversations, the more we talk about the lack of access in our communities, the more we talk about the lack of awareness, um, appropriate services for um, our people that are culturally relevant. These type conversations didn't exist when I was a teenager um, going through my own anxieties and depression. You know, these types of conversations didn't exist when my mom was trying to find her way. Um, these type of conversations didn't exist even two years ago when I was looking for resources to support my students that I work with at the high school level. So tonight's conversation is about um, speaking out and speaking up for what our people need, making mental wellness, making mental health a normal topic of conversation. You know, when, when we have the people, like someone said, um, you know, our, our sports um, people and the people that we watch for entertainment, when it's not a shock, to us that they said, you know, I need a time out because my mental health is important. Tonight's conversation is important because we need to make mental health just a normal word, a normal talk, topic of conversation. It needs to be just as easy to talk about. Um, I need a day for myself as it is to talk about um, my blood sugar may be out of control. You know, it, it just needs to be that normal. Um, I have children and I want my children to not bury this, this stuff. Julie has talked about, you know, just, just generational trauma and, and things that have been passed on from, you know, one person to another. And it's, and it's going through our, our family line. And um, like Miss Sandra talked about in the African-American church, we were taught to just pray about, it. you know, and I found, I found myself in a, in a situation in my own life where I am praying, but something is still not right. 
you know, I am praying, but I still have some things that I need help working through. But the, the, to, to seek out a therapist was so taboo because, well, how's that going to look for the family? You know, and you're supposed to be strong enough to handle everything that, that comes your way. And, and that's not true. So I really, really appreciate these conversations because like you referenced from our last, our first panel discussion, we learned that Georgia, we're at the bottom and this is the state that, I, that we all live in. We should not be at the bottom of anything. You know, our mental health priorities should be just as important as mental health priorities in any other state. And so um, it's an honor to be here um, as part of filling in the gaps because I just thought about it two years ago this time, I used to dream about conversations like this happening. You know, when, when people can openly engage in dialogue and, and talk about what's going on in their mind, when people can openly engage in, in dialogue and not feel bad about saying, you know, I'm still grieving um, the loss of my mother. And if I, don't, if I don't grieve properly, then depression is gonna kick in in a way that keeps, you know, it's just trickling down from generation to generation. So tonight is very. Ooh, Oni, I think you froze. That's okay. I get. I got what you said. One thing you triggered. Ability for is me, you froze. So one thing you said that triggered for me was how culturally relevant decolonized mental health therapy helps us interrupt unhealthy patterns that we have learned and gives us new coping tools for that are community culturally relevant. And that's a brilliant, brilliant addition. You froze for a Absolutely. minute there. So thank you. Y'all, as we close out this evening, I hope it has been beneficial for each and every one. Please look up our three therapists, keep their names on hand, send people to them, tell, brag on these amazing community builders. These are people that care about their community. Nobody's getting paid a penny for doing this. These are people that are like, I, we need to talk about this, right? So I, ne I need you to support them. I need you to hype them up. I need you to know their names. And there are a couple of call to actions I have for you right now. Number one, for Onipo and for Compassionate Atlanta, this is possible based on a grant from an organization called Global Ubuntu that priority, prioritizes our developmentally disabled community. And so we ask you to please fill out the survey that we put in the chat. And therapists, please fill that out for us also. And our second call to action is to watch all 10 clips of the decolonizing mental health at the link provided, right? And um, um, GPB has provided us that link. And then part of that, July is Bebe Moore Campbell's National Minority Health Awareness Month. This is also known as BIPOC Mental Health Month. And we invite you to download the study and toolkit at the, at the following site. We're gonna put that in the chat. There is a whole toolkit that talks about prayer circles, that talks about healing circles, that talks about justice circles, that talks, talks about singing and dancing as therapeutic aspects of community. And for, for people that are really attempting to have decolonized culturally relevant access to mental health, okay? Um, Emily, did we put that in there? That's the series. And then I can go and put in this other one here, which is the toolkit that I want to make sure everybody has access to. And of course, you know how this stuff goes. You can't ever find it when you need it. So here we go, I found it. I am the champion of all things Zoom. And here we go, I'm putting it in the chat. So please look out for that, look for that toolkit. This evening, our goal has been to create awareness to all kinds of people about the need for this culturally relevant mental health access. And the need to remember that if you're not 
that if you're not able to live out Eurocentric white middle class values, language from my brother Julius, you are not broken. Like Resma Manikin, the author of my grandmother says, my grandmother's hand says, you are not deficient. Again, uh, our sibling Julius reminded us of that. And remember what Miss Brother Lloyd said in the clip, you don't have to do this alone. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate each and every one of you. And we look forward to having more of these culturally relevant conversations in partnership with the amazing GPB that centers the priorities of the people of Georgia. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening. Good night, everybody. <laughs>